Welcome. Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Tricia Castrenio and I am a Global Environmental Health Program Manager here at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Thanks for joining us. Um, I have a couple things I'm going to share with you before we get started. Um, the most important reminder, of course, is that today's webinar is being recorded. Um, if you're having technical issues, please use the chat box and Paris, Nathan and I will do our best to address any issues that you have. Um, we have a great lineup of speakers. I know you're excited to be here and we look forward to having all of your questions. Please put them in the Q&A box and we will be, do our best to um, answer all of them. If you see a question that's very similar to what you were thinking or just another one that you liked, please give it the thumbs up and that will push it up on the priority list to uh, ensure that that one gets answered. Um, if your question does get answered today, um, please uh, feel free to reach out to our speakers directly. I will have their contact information on our last slide today. Um, let me introduce our host for today's event, uh, Dr. John Balbus. He is the Senior Advisor for Public Health to the Office of the Director here at the NIEHS. He is also the Director of the GEH Program, as well as the WHO Collaborating Center for Environmental Health Sciences. John, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Trisha, for the introduction and for setting this up, and also to, to Nathan Michener and team who are producing our, our webinar today and their expert um, facilitation. And welcome everybody to this sixth Climate, Environment, and Health Seminar. Um, this sixth seminar is, uh, it being October, is in honor of Children's Health Month and is entitled Climate Change and Its Impacts on Children and Youth. We very much appreciate all of you for joining us today. Uh, we are all bes beset by, by seminars and webinars, and so um, we're very grateful for your presence here. Our sixth session, this one will close out what I hope will just be the first session or the first season of our seminars. So please watch your inboxes in the new calendar year for announcements. Hopefully we will be uh, initiating this, this seminar series again for a second season um, after January. And with that, um, it's really a pleasure to be able to introduce our moderator. And I can think of no possible better moderator for our seminar in honor of Children's Health Month than NCO, but Witherspoon, who is the executive director of the Children's Environmental Health Network. NSA has been in that role for 18 years, and um, I've had the pleasure of, of knowing NSA and working with her for at least those 18 years, probably a little bit before that. Um, NSA is one of... Uh, reading her biography on, on her website and knowing this as well, one of the most sought after advisors and experts um, on children's environmental health that one can imagine. She's currently a member of the NIH Council of Councils. She's uh, been asked to be on the Science Advisory Board for the Centers for Disease Control. She's on the External Advisory uh, Science Board for the ECHO study, the environmental influences on child health outcomes of the NIH. Um, and she has a, a long resume of prior service, including the Children's Health Protection Advisory Council, our NIEHS Advisory Council, the Institute of Medicine, uh, Environmental Health Sciences Roundtable, the Board of the American Public Health Association. I could take up the whole seminar with this, uh, but we are very, very pleased to have her here. Um, NSA is also been the recipient of, of numerous awards, including having the honor uh, of a, an award uh, in, uh, for, for youth leadership um, named after her, uh, endowed after her uh, at the Children's Environmental Health Network, a really fabulous honor. Um, and NSA, of course, also comes by her expertise in children, their health and their environment uh, by uh, being the mother of four children who, who uh, many of us have had the pleasure of, of meeting some of them at uh, the, the meetings where, where NSA can be found. So with that, NSA, I, it's just a, a pleasure to have you uh, as our moderator today, and um, I'll turn it all over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Such a kind introduction. And I'm so honored to be here with everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And a big thank you to John and Tricia for their wonderful assistance in pulling the session together. Uh, climate change, as I believe we all understand, is one of, if not the largest threat to our children's health, as it places additional stress upon the availability of food, clean air, clean water, safe, equitable housing, and by the expand expanding the burden of disease from certain vector-borne diseases. Climate change also makes heat waves hotter and longer and potentially dangerous to children who want to play outside and need to play outside, 
when they do spend more time outdoors, it can lead to heat stress and greater exposure to disease carrying insects like ticks and mosquitoes, and not to forget the impacts to these children when it's hotter indoors. Rising temperatures and decreased air quality affects children by increasing asthma attacks and allergies, creating food insecurity, increasing mental health challenges and developmental delays and changes in their genetic makeup. We know that diseases spread through contaminated water and food may also be on the rise with more heavier rainfall that comes with climate change. Floods are associated with outbreaks of diarrheal diseases, which are particularly dangerous for infants and ch young children, and mold that grows in flooded homes and schools and childcare can trigger allergies. Heat, dry weather can also fuel forest fires and lead to a lot of other issues, uh, uh, harmful air pollutants and damaging our agriculture. And we know that these fires are likely to be more common into the 21st century due to the effects of climate change. We also know that the experience of trauma, especially in childhood, can promote lifelong health issues. And climate change presents a variety of traumatic events for families, for generations. Climate change matters to everyone's health, but in particular, those children who have more obstacles and fewer resources, like children with chronic me uh, medical health issues who face discrimination daily and, and or who live in poverty. Very excited we are today to have this panel that will highlight presentations from perspectives that provide leadership around some of the key areas of climate change and its impacts on the health and well-being of children. I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Gradia Huerta Montanez and earned her medical degree, doctor degree from the University of Puerto Rico of School of Medicine. She completed her residency training in pediatrics at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Cleveland, Ohio, and a subspecialty training on pediatric environmental health from the University of Puerto Rico graduate school of public health. She also worked as a pediatrician establishing a primary care clinic with Children's Healthcare of Atlanta as a staff pediatrician in private hospitals, mainly in the emergency room and as a voluntary pediatrician. From 2012 and 2014, she collaborated with the United States Environmental Protection Agency in the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, managing children with lead intoxication and helped launch a, a pediatric environmental health center in Puerto Rico with EPA funding at the University of Puerto Rico School of Public Health in partnership with the Mount Sinai School Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit. She is also currently working as a co-principal investigator in charge of the neurodevelopmental evaluation of infants and children in several NIH funded research projects, including PROTECT and ECHO, both studying how mixtures of environmental exposures and other factors affect the health and development of infants and children living in Puerto Rico. She's the vice president the, the climate, of the climate change and early childhood champion for the Puerto Rico chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics and a member of the Council on Environmental Health Executive Committee of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Huerta Montanez about a year ago um, as we were doing neurodevelopmental work, um, sustainable systems approaches. So it's such a pleasure to have you start us off today. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I'm very thankful to the NIHS staff who organized this event for inviting me to present and to my family who always supports me. Um, and it is a real honor to discuss with you today this important topic. This is my disclaimer statement. A few weeks ago, listening to a podcast about global warming, I reflected about how it seems like it was yesterday when I was a school-aged child and came across an article in the local newspaper about an expanding hole in the ozone layer. Reading the report drove me to make sure that our family stopped buying any products containing chlorofluorocarbons. That was my introduction to the world of environmental sciences. And it is an example of how powerful kids are if they're provided with the opportunities to learn and thrive. And it also reminded me about how seemingly small actions in our personal family lives can drive important changes to protect health. I vividly remember how I felt responsible for caring for that armor our planet has to protect life from damage. I'm firmly believed that using her spray can't with propellants to get that coveted 80s hairstyle once more <laughs> would cause harm to the planet 
And I am very glad that that was the last time I got that hairstyle. But my definite immersion in environmental health sciences happened this day. And it only strengthened with the birth of my other two sons. We have been hearing about the concept of global warming and its repercussions on the climate one way or another for decades. And the concept of greenhouses trapping heat has been recognized since the 1800s. But honestly, I never imagined that I would live to see the consequences that a changing climate could have on our planet and human health. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, a gorgeous archipelago located in the heart of the Caribbean. And except for my training years as a pediatrician and the subsequent three years of my husband's fellowship, I have lived there all my life. I bear witness to how this changing climate with increasing average temperatures has affected our daily lives. Here, we enjoy the gentle breeze under the most calming blue skies. But this past May was the hottest recorded in Puerto Rico since 1898. The science demonstrating the association between climate health and adverse health outcomes is strong. So it is essential that practicing and future clinicians become knowledgeable on what the data are telling us. Environmental health and climate change curricula should be incorporated into medical, nursing, and other health-related careers education. And as a society, we must make sure that environmental and climate sciences are well-funded and supported. The adverse consequences of climate change are not the same for everyone. Children are among the most vulnerable, and most probably, all of you have heard the iconic statement, children are not little adults. Infants and children breathe more volume of air per minute, eat more food, and drink more water per kilogram of body weight than adults. According to their developmental stage, they can display behaviors such as hand mouth, which may put them at increased risk of environmental exposures. Their body systems experience tremendous changes during the prenatal period and the first years of life, and specific windows of vulnerability in which the susceptibility of the developing organs to toxic insult is heightened and can result in more damage. Human brain development is particularly susceptible to environmental influences, and the adverse consequences can be devastating. All these behavioral, psychosocial and health needs of young children may then also particularly vulnerable to extreme weather events which are associated with global warming. The American Academy of Pediatrics has highlighted the extreme weather events place children at risk for injury, loss of separation from caregivers, from their parents, exposure to infectious diseases, and a uniquely high risk of mental health consequences including post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and adjustment disorder. Thanks to environmental health research and those working to appraise and disseminate the findings, medical professionals, others in the care continuum of children, and policymakers have wide-ranging resources to better protect pregnant women and children from exposures that may lead to cancer, learning disabilities and behavioral problems, neurodevelopmental deficiencies, asthma, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. And yet, some of these conditions are prevalent among our children. In Puerto Rico, for example, 14% of children and adolescents have asthma, the highest prevalence in the United States and territories. And despite commendable improvements, Puerto Rico continues to have one of the highest rates of premature births in the United States. And science is increasingly showing that both of these conditions are influenced by climate change. The same pollution resulting from fossil fuel burning that is driving climate change is also decreasing the quality of the air we breathe with particulate matter, ozone, and other greenhouse gases. In addition, the increase in temperature directly affects air quality. We should redouble our efforts to translate this knowledge to our communities, helping them overcome health inequities, which influence the extent of climate change, adverse outcomes, and sadly are still so prevalent in the 21st century. We must heed sound science and the precautionary principle when appropriate to protect our children. 
An estimated 90% of the excess heat caused by greenhouse emissions is trapped by ocean waters, becoming a source of energy that results in hurricanes that are stronger, develop faster, and last longer. On September 20, 2017, 3.5 million Americans experienced firsthand how a single climate change related event can bring them a devastation combination of effects that put all communities, particularly children and vulnerable people at risk of short-term and long-term adverse health consequences. And despite our experience at Islanders in the tropics, we could not foresee, we could not foresee what was ahead. With less than two weeks to recover from Irma, Maria hit as a category four hurricane with sustained winds of 155 miles per hour and remained over our island for what seemed as an eternity traveling at 10 miles per hour. Those were excruciating hours and the following several months are still very, very fresh in our psyches and our hearts. As we're still mourning the loss of thousands of lives and have many reminders every day around us about that awful day. This hurricane gave us a real life lecture on what climate change can do to human health. There were reports of people falling from the roofs during the preparation of the event for the event, injury due to destruction debris, and thousands of homes destroyed down to their foundations with the resulting homelessness. Thousands of homes required blue tarp roofs, and still today, in 2020, three years from this event, we have approximately 20,000 fellow citizens with blue roofs over their heads. Children living in shelters were at increased risk of gastrointestinal diseases, dehydration, scabies, respiratory illnesses, and lack of safe sleep, safe feeding, and hygiene facilities. Children with special needs and infants less than a year were at higher risk for morbidity and mortality. In another resemblance to the COVID pandemic, children's lives were completely disrupted with schools and daycare closed for extended periods of time, lack of healthy spaces to grow, develop and play, and lack of consistent preventive medical care. The destruction of bridges and roads and the complete collapse of telecommunications took months to rebuild and restore. Lack of medical care access, not only because clinicians were victims of the devastation themselves, but also because patients had no means to get to the hospital, the hospitals were flooded or lacked electricity. The lack of refrigeration made it difficult to maintain medical grade storage for vaccines and a national shortage of IV fluid injection bags that lasted months was the consequence of the devastation caused by the hurricane to the pharmaceutical facilities in the town of Hayuya. The lack of power for over eight months, wow, in many parts, even more, caused, caused very extreme situations from children unable to get a nebulizer asthma treatment to surgeons having to finish operating on patients with the help of cell phone flashlights because the hospital generator malfunctioned. These challenges at healthcare facilities are reminiscent of what happened in New York City after Hurricane Sandy. Using a power generator for months, and I can give testimony of that, proved to be very traumatic. The noise contamination, the decreased air quality outdoor and indoor were additional collateral effects. Without electricity, we had no way to refrigerate our food, increasing the risk of food poisoning. So ice bags became a precious commodity. This translated to standing in a line, and we did that, sometimes under the sun for eight hours just to buy a rationed bag of ice. Thousands of people made such lines to buy gasoline or diesel to fuel their generators. And the acquisition, transportation, storage, and use of these products caused a hazard to people not taking precautions, and many sought hospital care due to intoxication or injuries from improper use of electric generators. Finding food also became a struggle because our food distribution system was completely disrupted. So if we managed to get any, um, to any uh, food market, many times the shelves are empty, very frustrating, very dangerous. In addition, many of the local harvests were completely lost. The lack of clean water was another risk that lasted for months. Initially, we had no water service, which led to some of 
uh, buying water um, that was being distributed in unofficial truck tanks to later find out that this water could have potentially come from a Superfund site located in the town of Dorado. And what about the subsequent use of bottled water for months with the increased exposure to phthalates and its effects on pregnant women and their infant's health? Similar to the current pandemic, there was an increase in solid waste, with all this plastic ending in landfills because the lack of an efficient recycling system. For many, our research projects represented the only source for safe clean water and for other basic needs through our community engagement core. In some places, the flooding led to stagnant waters with chemical and microbiological contamination. This water hazard caused growth of mold in residences and buildings, putting at risk the people with asthma, allergies, and other immune compromised. Increased vector-borne illnesses is another threat that we faced. And remember, Puerto Rico was the epicenter of the Zika epidemic in 2016. There was a leptospirosis outbreak without an efficient surveillance system to help mitigate the risks and with authorities reluctant to properly frame and address the risk. This devastation led to the displacement of approximately 400,000 people from the island. Many children endured traumatic separations from family and other important relationships in their lives. This bleak situation without end in sight bred hopelessness, exacerbated by a poorly coordinated resource response from the local and federal governments. One factor stressing the federal response was the slew of major disaster that preceded Hurricane Irma that same year. Therefore, this climate change menace can engender a reinforcing negative feedback loop, breeding larger disasters, hampering the recovery and weakening resilience. Even in the absence of major disasters, the steady rise in average global temperature results in a shifting baseline and we get accustomed to worsening conditions. As David Roberts recently wrote on Vox.com, we calibrate our expectations to the world we were born into, irrespective of what came before, and in so doing, we unintentionally discount the severity of threats to our well-being. The toxic stress caused by extreme weather events has the potential of leading to pathological changes in children's brain anatomy and physiology. These changes can make children more susceptible to stress-related disorders in the realms of mental and physical health. The wildfires in California, some that also occurred in 2017 and that have been destructive since, and now in Colorado and Utah, present yet another concrete example of how climate change can lead to morbidity and mortality in our communities causing the tragic loss of lives, family displacements, and homelessness, and decreased air quality that can reach hundreds of miles away. There, as it happens in disasters elsewhere, children's mental health is affected with the trauma of loss and toxic stress. Studies suggest that interventions that provide consistent, predictable, and nurturing care help to stimulate positive adaptation to prevent poor outcomes, but we must, must focus on providing that opportunity to all ch children. Climate change repercussions on human health stand well beyond the acute phase of the emergency. And it can even have transgenerational effects via epigenetic modifications. What happened during Hurricane Maria was also a lesson of how ill-prepared we were to respond to emergencies. Now the world is facing a pandemic that has shown us once again how important it is to take preparedness seriously. Needless to say that these are very trying times. Climate change is a real global emergency that is unfolding right before our eyes during this pandemic, as evidenced by the association between increased air particulate matter with increased COVID-19 mortality, and yet, tragically, it has been politicized and used to polarize our societies. We're all concerned, we're definitely all suffering, and our world needs climate leadership. All these crises have highlighted the profound injustices and inequities that we're ignoring in the day to day. Economic, social, health, racial inequities, 
With COVID-19, we again witness how we're not all on the same boat. We must prioritize climate solutions to secure all people in their communities. Each one of us is called to become climate leaders and health and quality of life for all must be the core of our efforts and must be the thriving force. This can only happen if we face our moral responsibility, trust science and act with compassion and kindness. Each one of us is here because other fellow citizens are serving as essential workers caring for you and for me in the front line. They are the perfect example of emergency leaders. And they have shown us with actions that to lead, we must sacrifice and have empathy. Soon we'll have an opportunity to elect a slate of candidates that can help us face climate change as, an existential, as the existential crisis that it is. But we can only choose wisely if we're informed. We must support our public health systems and fine tune our preparedness and planning efforts. And we cannot accomplish this without respecting science. Facts and truths are important. So what is next? How can we put our minds and commitment together and make gains in the science, practice translation, policy formulation, and evaluation of environmental health portfolio? I reflect on my role as a mother, a pediatrician, a researcher, a citizen, and so much to learn, so much to do. But one thing is for sure, we cannot do this alone and we have to collaborate. There is hope. Discussion panels as this one present an opportunity to generate discussion, identify new ways to collaborate, to share ideas, to fulfill our noble goal of an environment where children can thrive. I leave you with one quote from Rachel Carson. The human race is challenged more than ever to demonstrate our mastery, not of our nature, but of ourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much. Such powerful uh, witnessing and work. We thank you for your leadership. Our second speaker will be Dr. Perry Sheffield. Dr. Sheffield is an associate professor in environmental medicine at pub in public health and pediatrics at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City, where she is the deputy director of the US P EPA oops, Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit. She completed her medical degree at the Medical College of Georgia Pediatrics with a residency at Johns Hopkins and Pediatric Environmental Health Fellowship and uh, maternal, uh, I'm sorry, and Masters of Public Health at Mount Sinai. Her research focuses on the health effects of climate change and adaptation strategies with a focus on children. Dr. Sheffield will be speaking on heat, learning impacts, air conditioning and neighborhood factors as driving racial disparities with a frame around trauma. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ense, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's an honor to be included as part of this panel. Um, so thank you for that. Yes, my name is Perry Sheffield. I'm a pediatrician practicing in New York City. And um, let's see if we can get slides going here. And uh, some might wonder how um, a girl raised in Georgia who ended up in New York City working in pediatrics uh, has chosen to focus on uh, climate change and environmental health more broadly as it affects children. Here's a shot from, from my neighborhood in East Harlem. And, um, and as I mentioned, I grew up in Georgia, um, but I spent a lot of my childhood um, actually living portions of each year in the Bahamas where my parents were working. And this island archipelago was, was my first introduction. So I wasn't island born, but I was kind of island raised. Um, these, uh, these islands, particularly the Abaco Bahamas in the northern part of that archipelago, are um, so low to ocean level that if you stand on your tiptoes, you can practically see across. And we actually were living on a, um, on a sailboat during this time. And there is probably not much in life that will make you more acutely aware of how we are um, very small compared to big nature and particularly weather patterns. 
And so this was my introduction. Um, but I have had um, a number of other sort of island orientations through family, extended family that lives in Indonesia, New Zealand, time spent um, during my undergraduate years in Madagascar in Africa, and all of those are island nations. And, um, and then to this, the slide you see now is of the, uh, the PESU units, the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Units, a network across the United States. And based in New York, we are part of Federal Region 2, which covers Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And as you just heard so beautifully from Dr. Huerta, um, uh, those islands are uh, acutely impacted uh, by changes that are happening. And that has been the focus of um, and my the opportunity that I've had in working with the PESU over the last decade to get to know people like Dr. Huerta and to learn about um, the vulnerabilities of of those islands. And so that, that's my island orientation. Um, and, and, and I think um, as, we, as we come to a time in, in biomedical research when we are asking, as we should all be, asking ourselves um, who, who makes up our community? Um, are we represented? Um, are we, do we have representation from all the groups that we want? Um, I think a lot about what provided me access, what gave me the orientation to focus and think about what I find important. Um, and also, um, and con conversely, what blocks people from, from that. I was in a white middle-class family uh, growing up in Georgia, but as I said, had uh, this rich network and these rich experiences that uh, oriented me to the natural world, which was very formative in my, in my worldview. Um, what I was not oriented to early on in my life were the impacts of uh, structural inequities, particularly as influenced uh, influence race. And I, I would posit that growing up as a person of color in the United States is, is almost, um, would orient you to the effects of racism um, as I was oriented to the effects of weather. Um, it is something that you had to pay attention to, to every day for your, for your survival for your navigation, for your for successfully navigating systems like education. Um, so it's with that framing that I, um, that I present these comments today. And as Ense said, I'm going to focus uh, for the next few minutes on heat. Um, we know that um, certainly the, the extreme events, the disaster, high wind, high precipitation events associated with a change in climate get lots of attention. Um, but we, we also know from, um, from the data that uh, in terms of weather events, heat probably kills more people and actually is more costly, um, particularly over the last decade, um, than any other natural or any other weather event. So what we see here is a pyramid depicting the potential burden of heat on children, ranging from the thankfully much more rare events of death at the top, so the more severe events at the top of the pyramid, down through things like hospital admissions, sort of severe but not deadly, um, to things that are more insidious. So absenteeism, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about learning, so cognitive function, we think about neurodevelopment lots when we focus on children, and then um, a, probably a much more widely impacted population, but much harder to study and much more insidious are subclinical effects and then sort of um, impacts on our, on our well-being that probably affect a much larger proportion of the population, particularly children. And so and this is how I think about heat and its burden. And um, thankfully in the early, well, so in the early works, we didn't see mortality impacts on children when we were looking at heat wave events. And I think in the, in the early mantras were that children are not so impacted by heat, but we knew physiologically uh, that that's not the case. Children are certainly more at risk because of their larger body, body surface area to things like dehydration when they're exposed to heat. And so we, so the thankful part of that is that we know that there's social protections in place that generally, by and large, keep children from, from dying or making it very rare events during hot weather events. But the other stuff is now we're starting to understand, think about, and start to operationalize um, 
And some of my work focuses on things that are still pretty much at the top of the pyramid, hospital admissions, emergency department visits as associated with heat. That's an area where we're doing some interesting unpacking and there's lots of work to be done. But the two studies I wanted to highlight in my brief comments today uh, focused on, focus on learning and structural causes of differential exposure. Um, some of you might have seen this um, article in the New York Times. It came out earlier this month that was talking about a study done by economists. I chose two studies to focus on that were not specifically NIH related because um, it's where I think that the health field needs to be um, also broadening and, and, and thinking about their work. So in brief, um, we, these studies showed, uh, it, was a, it was a couple of studies that showed that hotter days widened the racial gaps in, um, in testing scores, so in US schools. But specifically, um, they saw that these effects were um, pronounced in Black and Latino students, and they, they attributed that difference to uh, slower prevalence or lower penetration of air conditioning in the school settings where those children were, were learning and taking those tests from which they'd seen those results. So, and so we know, so this is a first step, right? We, the lower air conditioning prevalence is less of sort of an adaptation um, or access to an, an important adaptive uh, response under climate change. But there's another part to this picture that, um, that I think further work will start to unpack and we, is important. And that is this. Uh, that was a study by Hoffman, uh, who's a um, scientist out of the uh, Virginia Science Museum, and um, that came out earlier this year. And uh, what he and his colleagues showed by looking at homeowners loan corporation um, designations of neighborhoods um, in terms of their risk for, um, for, for loans, but by and large what we know now, many of us are familiar with the term redlining, was that those neighborhoods that were deemed uh, hazardous for loans were, were deemed that primarily based on the proportion of black people living in those neighborhoods. So, so strictly on a, on a racist um, uh, framing. And consequently, that led to uh, less ability to acquire loans, uh, less home ownership options, and subsequently less investment um, in those communities. And, and then also often um, uh, what I would class as violent um, acts by government of doing things like building uh, uh, freeways through those neighborhoods, which led to increased other exposures like air pollution um, and disruption of those communities. And so what these maps show are the, the um, those homeowner loan corporation designations on the upper left. On the upper right is a, is a temperature, surface temperature map, which you can see highly correlates the lightest color is the hottest temperature, highly correlates with those those historically red line zones. And then on the lower two pictures, you see tree cover um, and impervious surface. So less tree cover and higher amounts of tree of impervious surface, all are probably underlying mechanism that contribute now to the higher um, heat in those areas. And so I wanna juxtapose this study with the one that we just looked at about children learning with lower air conditioning prevalence and think about that those neighborhoods at a baseline are uh, hotter. And so not only is it less of the adaptive capacity, the, the adaptive tool, but it's, it's a higher exposure in the first place. And so there's so much more that could be said about this, but I think that um, it's important to think about um, uh, these structural causes and the, um, uh, how this translates into the environments that we're providing for our children. I'm gonna stop there. Thank you so much, Perry, for that very helpful introduction as well to those topics. And we look forward to discussing more on economics, heat, and even trauma um, after we're done with our presentations. Thank you very much. Our third speaker will be Dr. Leslie Rubin, who's the Associate Professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the Morehouse School of Medicine, Adjunct Associate Professor in the Department of Pediatrics at Emory University School of Medicine, and Co-Director of the Southeast Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit at Emory University, Medical Director of the Rubin Center for Autism and Developmental Pediatrics as well. 
in 2004, Dr. Rubin sta started a program called the Break the S Cycle of Environmental Health Disparities and is the founder of Break the Cycle of Health Disparities Incorporated. It's a private nonprofit 501c3 organization that is dedicated to reducing health disparities worldwide. Dr. Rubin will be speaking on the realities of child health disparities and climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ense, and uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to uh, present to you. Um, I'll need to share my screen. Um, I hope that has come through. And um, yes. climate change, right. Here's my disclaimer, and here's my first slide, which is to uh, look at what um, health disparities are. These are health differences linked with social, economic, and environmental disadvantage. And you heard the two previous speakers um, talk about both the uh, urban situation and, and the island situation, which exemplified disparities. And we just need to look at the US to see that the, there's such a disparity between the health of children as um, exemplified in infant mortality between those mothers who have means and those mothers who don't have means. The ones who have means uh, have an infant mortality of one to two per thousand live births. And that compares to the best in the world, like Scandinavian countries in Japan, whereas the disadvantaged mothers uh, have a mort infant mortality around five to six, which compares them to uh, pretty poor countries around the world. So we are living in a pretty disparate country. And I think our job is to try to reduce that. And what is the character of the disparities? And you heard mention of, of poverty and, and racism, and that's exactly what it is. And this is a, a statement made by uh, Bernard Dreyer, who was the uh, former president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, who uh, wrote a paper entitled Racial and Ethnic Bias in Pediatric Care and the Criminalization of Poverty, in which he said, uh, quoted, that more than 16% of children in 2018 were living below the federal poverty level, and a third of them were black a third of them Native American, a quarter of them Latinx, and just over 10% white children. And if you uh, heard previous speakers that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has actually uh, revealed that in stark um, uh, contrast to, with all the mortality. Now, where do these people live? They live in poor communities. You heard Perry Sheffield, my colleague, talk about the um, heat islands in the poor, poor urban areas, but these un poor, poor urban areas have unsafe neighborhoods where it's difficult to go out. You're worried about green sp lack of uh, crimes and lack of green spaces, and they tend to stay home and eat uh, uh, processed food rather than experience uh, better food quality, <clears throat> experience violence, exposure to drugs, get into drug cultures, live in older houses where they're more likely to get lead toxicity, twice as likely to get asthma and three times as likely to die from asthma. And as Perry mentioned, the schools, uh, they're 50% less likely to graduate from high school. Their schools are in a state of disrepair. Their teachers are less motivated, less paid. And these, these individuals, these children are less likely to be employed after they leave school. And what happens when you're unemployed? And I, I also want to add that, that, that uh, toxic uh, factories are often built near poor neighborhoods. Um, this is what happens if you look at the total picture. It is a cycle of environmental health disparities, which is driven by poverty and in this country by racism, where having a poor education gives you poor opportunities to learn, low income. Uh, you don't choose where you live. You live in adverse environmental circumstances. There's chronic stress, there's environmental exposures, and it has adverse health conflict consequences on pregnancy, on physical health, and on mental health. Now, what about uh, uh, climate change? And uh, I love this um, little piece in the New York Times. It said, as Earth heats up, inequity boils over, 
and at the top of it, it says, if you're poor and marginalized, you're likely to be more vulnerable to extreme weather. Now we're talking about climate change and extreme weather where we extreme weather is it actually very old, but it is occurring much more frequently. This is a graphic from the Center for um, uh, uh, Disasters, uh, documentation of disasters that shows that since the mid century after the wars, uh, the rise in, in, in temperature has corresponded with a rise in natural disasters. And we see this in the US with the wildfires on the West Coast, with the droughts in the Southwest, with hailstorms in the mid country, with tornadoes, with um, electric storms, with ice storms and with tornadoes on the coast. And these uh, have increased in, 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 in frequency, have increased in intensity. And this particular graphic from the NOAA uh, actually is every disaster that costs more than a billion dollars is recorded here. So you can see how many billion dollars have been spent on these disasters. And if you look on the left side of the slide, it says that a disaster may be indiscriminate in how it um, plays out but the poor and medically underserved bear an inequitable burden. And if we look at the uh, outcomes or the death rates in, in countries by levels of income, you'll see on the far right of the slide, the countries with low income have three times to four times more uh, a higher death rate than you have in the higher middle and <clears throat> lower middle countries. And if we have a look uh, at another country across the Atlantic, which is uh, in Africa or countries in Africa, um, where the temperatures are rising faster, there are droughts and floods, and the farmlands dramatically degraded. We look at the situation of farmers who need to graze their cattle. So what happens is because there's such a drought and there's no green uh, nourishment for these cattle, they move for northward to um, where the crops are. But there's farmers in the, those areas and they're trying to grow the crops. And this sort of presents this conflict that has also a biblical history between the two brothers, the farmer and the herder uh, that ended tragically. And uh, we've seen the uh, climate refugees from Africa fleeing uh, across the Mediterranean a couple of years ago, which were dramatically um, brought to us in the news and in the newspapers, um, the people trying to get to a place where they could eat and be safe and, and uh, uh, happen to get um, uh, marooned in the Mediterranean. So if we just look at climate change in underserved communities, uh, children account for 88% of yearly deaths attributed to climate change, with 99% of those children from underserved communities. And so these underserved communities obviously have a limited capacity to prevent or treat the illnesses. So what can we do? We can take this cycle and we can try and break the cycle. Uh, which is a project that we have. And uh, it, it, it behooves each one of us to take some action on reducing this um, uh, environmental impact and also of breaking the cycle. And if we break the cycle, we can get a more green and verdant uh, world and there's health equity between children. And this is my parting words to you. Uh, which is that we, we need to act. We may not necessarily be able to complete our tasks, but we're definitely compelled to undertake the challenge. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Rubin. And our final speaker before our collective discussion is Isabella Fal Falahi. She's a 17-year-old climate justice advocate that lives, an activist that lives in Indianapolis. At the year of 16 years of age, she was formed an international coalition dedicated to fighting for fossil fuel divestment known as Polluters Out. And she previously worked for Zero Hour in organizing the first ever Youth Climate Summit. She has spoken at the United Nations 25th Conference of the Parties and numerous events about the importance of uplifting the voices of those who are disproportionately impacted by climate change and environmental degradation.
She is best known for speaking at the global climate strike in New York City alongside Greta Thun Thunberg. Uh, however, her activism extends far beyond her achievements. Activism for her is personal and is a matter of survival, not just doing what is right. She has been featured in Vogue, MSNBC, Elle Magazine, and the Washington Post, and numerous publications as an interviewee, correspondent, and writer. And we're very pleased to have Isabella speaking about her work, her passions, and how all has gone when partnering and leveraging with the public health research community, and of course, any other feedback she may have as far as when we look at our own research and activism. Thank you so much, Isabella. Thank you so much, Ensaid. So, um, first off, hi everyone. My name is Isabella Falahi, and I know I'm supposed to really talk about the way in which my activism has intersected with the public health community, and I'll definitely talk about that. But something that I do think that really needs to be brought more into this discussion is we've had a lot of facts and just general data and numbers thrown at us, and um, in order to really describe and quantify um, the climate crisis and who it disproportionately impacts. But I want to really humanize it um, because when we look at data and figures and numbers, we don't really feel emotions as much as we do when we hear people's direct climate stories. So my climate story um, living in Indianapolis, I live around 10 miles away from a generating facility in a state in which is ranked 46th for air quality. And in the southern part of my state of Indiana, we do have a bustling coal industry, in which has undoubtedly contributed and significantly worsened my asthma over the years. And this was a wake up call for me when a few summers ago, I began waking up in the middle of the night feeling as if I couldn't even breathe. I couldn't yell for help. I felt as if I was drowning. And so we've heard a lot about the way in which heat waves and air pollution all considerably worsen asthma and also allergies, which then created this cycle for me of just asthma attacks year round. And so, it became really difficult to live like that and to function like that. Could barely focus on school or debate or many of the other things in my life that I love to do because my asthma was such a limiting factor. And I have no doubt that my background as a first generation American, as a Latina, and as a Middle Eastern person, that this, that my very identity from birth had made me already more likely to face these types of circumstances. And I know it's like that for many people. So particularly within my work in forming this international coalition, um, I've had the opportunity to meet hundreds, if not thousands of people from across the world. And many of them share the same experiences that I have. And so when we really do look at the climate crisis, the, the whole of today's discussion has been based around the after effects of climate change and how those particularly impact um, predominantly people of color and youth and children. But what my work in Polluters Out focuses on is the initial effects of climate change. What causes this crisis? The fossil fuel industry and inaction. And of course, many other polluting industries. But when we do break down global greenhouse gas emissions, those are who the culprits are. And so when we look about at the amount of money that is going in to them propping up their projects, they're giving, uh, they're receiving massive amounts of money and investments from banks. They're, they themselves are donating to our politicians. They, they have a part of endowments from large universities like Harvard and Columbia. And when we further look at this, it creates this cycle in which 
we as youth and people, regardless of who's disproportionately impacted, we are put second to financial interests. And that is really what is uh, the root cause of climate change. It's greed. And in its purest form, it's pure selfishness. Um, oftentimes in the discussion of climate change, I also do think that um, for white climate activists, for upper middle class climate activists, the whole framing of the fight around climate change has been constructed to be, this is the fight for our future. But as we heard from, <clears throat> sorry, as we heard from Gredia, as we heard from many of the different presentations that were shown today, climate change is already happening. And it's the fight for survival right now for many people. Particularly when we do look at this, and we do look at the impacts of COVID-19, when we look at the mortality rates, the people that had the largest mortality rates were Black, Latinx, and Native American individuals. And I truly do think that, and I'm sure that everyone else has proved today, this links back to environmental racism. And environmental racism is seen in so many of the various communities that we've had discussed today. When we look at New York, um, which is where one of the speakers was from, there's currently a fracked gas pipeline being built in Brooklyn, all the way from Williamsburg to Bushwick and Brownsville, which is a predominantly black and brown community. And what we do know about fracked gas is it's even more harmful when it comes to air pollutants. This is an example of environmental racism. An example of environmental racism is when we do look at how pipelines are, have been and are being historically built through indigenous communities and reservations. Someone in my activism who I've had the absolute honor of working alongside, her name is Takata Iron Eyes. And Takata is Lakota Sioux. And from being around nine years old, had fought against a pipeline being built through her own community and her own reservation. And even when we look abroad, I think we're focusing a lot also on the sole aspects of climate change just within the United States, but we forget about the impacts in which the United States has on other countries. Just when we look at Gredia's um, example of the poor response to Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Irma, that is unequivocally a symptom of the colonial status of Puerto Rico. And when we further look to the Middle East, where my family is from, I tend to think back to the Iraq War. And what rings in my head is exactly what was said by the head of US Central Command in Iraq, which was, of course, it was about oil. We can't really deny that. And when we do think about the fallout of Iraq, we think about the thousands that were killed, innocent civilians and children, and the thousands of more that were displaced. We think about those photos of children washed up on the ground from just having drowned, trying to flee. And children that still don't have a home as a result, who lost their parents. So that is really what Polluters Out focuses on at its core is how do we take out these special interests? 
because ultimately it affects the global south, people of color, and youth and children the most. And I do th completely agree with something that Ense mentioned um, at the very beginning of this panel is the trauma that's associated with all of this. And when I went to COP last year, the Conference of the Parties, which is the UN climate negotiations, at that very time, Australia was burning the entire country slash continent. And I had met Australian activists who were crying, looking back at photos from their homes in Sydney, where you couldn't even see the bay or 10 feet away from you. The trauma that's associated with children having to pack their bags and leave their home that they may never see again in California, or the trauma that children in Flint, Michigan for the past five years haven't had access to clean water. There are children that have never known anything other than a water bottle. These are all impacts of environmental racism and all examples. And it comes at the very root of political inaction. And why is this political inaction occurring? When we do often look at the climate movement, it's predominantly young people, women, and people of color that are taking up arms against this. And so, some of the various things I've noticed, just among other speakers, um, is just the same pattern that we haven't really in this whole discussion even tied climate change to a phenomenon, to a source. Where is this coming from? Now, there have been many arguments that have been made that climate change does come and go in waves over the course of centuries when we do look at science. However, it hasn't been quite to the scale. Where is this coming from? It has to come from somewhere. And when we do look at one report that was done by, um, I think it was the... Uh, carbon insiders or something. I'm sorry, I'm spacing out. <laughs> but it showed that the world's top 100 Fortune 500 companies were responsible for more than 70% of greenhouse gas emissions dating back to the 1980s. And in the 1980s and in the 1970s even was when politicians and the fossil fuel industry started to know about climate change, that they put their own profits over the lives of people of color. When we do look at Exxon and Shell and Chevron, their, their actions as US-based companies largely um, it affects people around the world, youth around the world. One of the co-founders of Polluters Out, her name is Elena Gualinga, and she is Quichua indigenous from Ecuador. And it was in the early 2000s when Chevron had spilled tons of oil in the Amazon rainforest. And still again, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there was once again another oil spill in the Amazon in Ecuador. And this had pr a profound impact on the indigenous community in Ecuador, a company in which makes a lot of its profits, gets a lot of its subsidies from the United States federal government, was responsible for causing a health crisis in the Amazon among indigenous youth who began breaking out with rashes and skin issues as a result of this. 
and I understand I go off and I ramble a bit and you may be confused on my line of reasoning, but we also haven't discussed solutions and that's where I'm going to start wrapping up today. What are our solutions? We have clearly companies that have determined communities of color as lesser value and lesser importance time and time again with the numerous projects I've listed to the data that's been shown in these presentations. And we've also had government in action persist over decades when they knew of this crisis dating back to the 80s. How do we solve something that it seems almost we have very little time left to solve? And in fact, it's even more urgent for frontline communities like my own. We solve it by cutting that connection between our leaders and those that are causing this crisis and continue to for their own profits. And that's exactly what Polluters Out's about. And we have had the opportunity to work with scientists and uh, those that are public health officials from around the world, in fact, that have helped us further compile data and evidence to show that really this political inaction and the valuing of profits over people is a public health crisis on an absolute global scale. And I think that that has only been reiterated and solidified by everyone else here today. Thank you so much, Isabella. And if all of our speakers could please turn their uh, video cameras on and uh, we'll see how many questions we can get through. We've got a good amount here. Just really appreciate everyone's uh, attention, expertise, perspective. And uh, let's, let's see how, how we can go out here. We have Leon Vinci has a great question here, noting that uh, we have definitely been recording the, the warmest um, heat index uh, numbers on record in the last couple years. And definitely he's, he's knowing the last three months in particular, how long will it, since these recordings have been happening, how long will it take for this new heat data for children so mortality, increased hospitalizations, and HE episodes to be collected and released to us. Does anyone have any sense of that? Sure, I can jump in there. Thanks, Mary. And historically, when we were relying on administrative data from hospitals and emergency departments, um, often there's a several year delay because of the, the reporting time and the cleaning and the processing. I think what um, makes me optimistic that we'll be able to get more real-time data is things like syndromic surveillance systems um, that are in place now, for example, here in New York City. Um, every day there are downloads of emergency department data to our Department of Health so that they can keep a, their finger on the pulse of the health of the of the residents. And then through electronic health records becoming more pervasive, um, we'll be able to get sooner um, data back, if you will, to be able to understand. And I think the question is really relevant to understand the impacts of our, of our interventions. Thank you very much. And while you're at it, there was a question specifically about addressing heat index and frontline communities. Would you like to add anything else as far as specific targeted solutions that we should be focusing in on? Sure. Um, while sometimes it feels um, counterproductive to talk about air conditioning when we're, talking, when we're talking about trying to conserve energy, I think it's very important to talk about equitable distribution of air conditioning, meaning um, there is lots of room for lowering or raising the thermostats, if you will, so decreasing air conditioning use in big buildings, um, in uh, retail areas, while we are increasing um, air conditioning to vulnerable populations, or as I talked about in schools, for example. And so there needs to be an offset there. There's also some very uh, great uh, cool building interventions that can be done um, for, for schools, for example, with looking at uh, lighter colored building materials, different roofing materials, um, more vegetation, the things that we know that um, are lacking in areas where there are those micro urban heat islands, we can, we can counter those with built environment interventions to complement the air conditioning. Thank you. And this is coming up time after time, um, sadly. And I would also add our learning environments as well. Um, many children are not in their learning environments right now, but uh, the rising heat index has been uh, faced by 
you know, our school systems for sure. Um, and I would imagine even early learning uh, where they have to get very creative, sadly, instead of just having the resources they need to address the rising heat. Uh, Dr. Rubin, there's a question for you. The topics discussed and many others are great examples of how climate change impacts human health. Some are old topics and some are new, but we keep seeing the cycle spin downwards. How do practitioners in this space overcome the economic versus environmental argument is the first part of the question. And then the second one is what kind of job opportunities should graduate and medical students be seeking in this field? And I would add maybe to contribute and add to and be a part of the solutions in this arena. Well, <laughs> um, <clears throat> say, could you ask the first question again, please? Sure. Um, and then how, the second one after. Sure. How do practitioners in this space overcome the economic and environmental argument? when we're looking at climate change impacts and human health overall? You know, I, I, the way I look at it is if you're looking at natural disasters, as I showed in the slide from NOAA, um, each of those disasters cost over a billion dollars. Um, and the disasters are increasing in frequency um, and they are um, increasing in intensity and increasing not only in the impact on human lives, but in on the environment and on damage. So it becomes almost the cycle of environmental degradation. What I'd like to point out is that even with this COVID cost, for example, where the cost of hospitalizations is absurd and the cost of lives is absurd if there would be an investment in prevention i think that the return on investment would be so great that um, the economists would cheer but as our uh, our um, uh, climate activist uh, commented the actions that we should be taken are somehow um, crippled and undermined by powerful political, political and, and economic forces. And so um, each one of us should act in, in a way that will um, address the health disparities issues and the climate change issues. And if enough of us can come together, enough climate activists can come together around the world and enough clinicians can address these issues every day with every person and in every interaction, I think that will make uh, collectively make a big difference. I, I hope that responds to the first question and then the second question. Sure. Oh boy, I'm losing track here. There we go. Oh, sorry. There's just more and more coming in. That's wonderful. Okay. And then the second part of the question, I'm sorry, Lizzie, I'll have to come back. I guess I've yeah, lost. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Please, I'll come back to you on, on that. Oh, here it is. And then um, what kind of job opportunities? for graduate and medical uh, school students that uh, may be seeking um, work or interest in this field. Any quick uh, suggestions of where folks may go with such an interest? Well, certainly um, there are plenty of opportunities for graduate medical students or medical students who are graduating. If you go into the clinical medicine, taking care of patients, you deal with people one-on-one -on -one and educate them. If you go into academia, you teach them. If you go into public health, you make big changes in uh, larger communities. And if you go into uh, public uh, policy, you make the biggest changes. So I say each level, you'll make a change and each uh, opportunity you have, you can make incrementally bigger changes. Thank you so much, well said. Uh, Gradia, we have a question for you from Stephen Alt. Uh, the data and stories shown about mainland USA and Puerto Rico are uh, around climate change and children's environmental health burden are eye-opening. There's a lot of questions here, so I'll try to get through a few. Are any countries at the same latitude globally having a similar health burden from your standpoint? Yeah, um, you know, there, obviously there, there is uncertainty inherent to the climate modeling. And um, so we need data and not all these, regions have data so we can 
make those predictions, but, um, and it will require collaborative work between different disciplines. And we know NOAA collects uh, this information and the climate related disease burdens are multifactorial, but um, there is evidence from observations gathered since 1950 of, um, change in some extremes. So it's very likely that there has been an overall decrease in the number of cold days and nights and an overall increase in the number of, of warm days and nights at the global scale. But then as I said again, in terms of predicting from specific places, we must have the data. Um, on the other hand, um, it is likely, you know, according to, to what we have, uh, data that we have, it is like frequency of heavy precipitation or the proportion of total rainfall from heavily rainfall will increase in this century. And we're seeing that over many areas of the globe. And this is particularly the case in high altitude and tropical regions where Puerto Rico is. And in winter in the northern mid latitude. So heavy rainfalls associated to tropical cyclones are likely to increase. And the other thing that I've read about this is that um, with um, greenhouse uh, warming effects um, such uh, have been causing effects such as increasing vertical wind she um, shear over the Caribbean where Puerto Rico is located and has led to fewer but more intense hurricanes, which is what we've, we've been seeing in this area. But certainly there, there's a lot more to do in terms of collecting data and translating this and analyzing. Yes, thank you so much. Isabella, a, a lot of wonderful questions for you. Um, I'll try to pick out a few here. Uh, understanding that uh, there are really practical steps or responses or actions that can bring a dramatic change to the reverse the effect of climate change implications now and to increase the survival rate of children and youth. Um, if, if you have suggestions of, I mean, you're obviously in the midst and you mentioned a few, but when we talk about the safe and future uh, viability of our planet, but obviously our humanity, uh, these are heavy, heavy questions, but if you have any specific narrowed um, opportunities that we should be having more of a laser focus on, especially in the public health, public re health research communities, we would welcome those thoughts. Absolutely. So I really love this question and I was reading it in the Q&A section actually. And I think that some that the biggest thing members of the public health community, scientists and doctors alike, is you guys need to become activists as well. It cannot just be left up to my generation and to youth like myself. This is an intergenerational movement and it is absolutely detrimental that we have people with your kinds of expertise that are joining us in this fight and can help provide the scientific basis as you have time and time again for the urgent action that is needed. And ultimately we need to let the science dictate the policy that is to be formed. So yes, become activists and fight for divestment, fight for our politicians and leaders to actually put people over profit, but then use your scientific expertise to dictate the policies that we absolutely need to meet um, the challenge that we are faced with. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Leslie, Dr. Rubin, Bill Pan had an interesting question on break the cycle and how to make sure that health policies also consider environmental factors and other unintended environmental health consequences. A really good point. Um, any any thoughts you have there? Can I just ask what, what's meant by the unintended environmental consequences? Does the speaker want to elaborate? Um, off the cuff, there are many unintended environmental um, consequences of just about everything we do. Um, Perry mentioned the air conditioning, which keeps places cool, you're using energy, you're, um, you're uh, creating further uh, adverse environmental effects, uh, but uh, you need to consider health, so you need to balance, and it's all got to do with a balance, balance between utility and, um, and, and uh, waste and utility and pollution. And I think this is a struggle we, we enter all the time. Um, chemicals that have been produced to perform, perform certain function uh, turn out to be uh, 
consequential, adversely consequential, fertilizers and pesticides that are used can then have an adverse effect, not only on, on children, but on pregnant women and their, their offspring. So I think that what, what happens is that just about anything we do, we have to evaluate and continue to evaluate. And that is the role of science. So I promote the value and the role of science in, in evaluating everything we do and in helping to develop strategies and um, solutions to our current dilemma. Thank you so much. Louise had an interesting question too. Um, when we look uh, at uh, what Sweden is doing and applying the stress and coping theory of Richard um, Lazarus and Susan Folkman to empirical data on children and youth with climate change fears to identify how to help young people cope in healthy ways that enable them to acknowledge the distressing facts without falling into despair. Would any of you, this could be open to any panelists, know of other researchers who are also looking at this, such as helping children and youth cope with the mental health effects of climate fears and, and anxiety and supporting them and finding positive ways to respond, such as you know, Isabella's uh, fantastic leadership and activism. Well, I must say, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, have um, encouraged clinicians to start talking about this with our patients and our families. And um, personally, I think that as, based on my experience as pediatrician and, and as a mother, we, we need to continue looking for solutions, as Isabella is mentioning, but at the same time, while we do that work, which is you know, a huge work that needs collaboration and we need to continue pushing for that. But there are simple things that people can do at home, even small things. Um, and kids should know that, that there are little things that can make a big difference. So while science you know, is translated into public policy and you know, everybody's on board, in the meantime, there are things that we can do, little acts that we can do at home um, in terms of the way we use energy and the way we use our resources, for example. Um, so kids should know that um, there are already some solutions that we can apply and then they can apply and then they can promote, for example, in their homes, in their schools, and kids love to be involved. I mean, they, they, that's their nature. And, and so um, I think that we should support that. Um, uh, so uh, I think there are things that we can do to empower the kids and probably that would decrease those fears and decrease the uncertainty that is related to, to this topic. Thank you so much. Uh, Isabella, John Rosenfield asked, um, based on your own experience with healthcare professionals, do you personally think that pediatricians are adequately educated in your humanized perspective of environmental health? Absolutely. I would like to see more pedi pediatricians out on the streets with us. I would like to see more pediatricians um, really taking the grassroots action that is needed. Um, beyond just simply speaking on panels and discussions about how important this all is. Because at the end of the day, um, we can all talk about how urgent the climate crisis is and how, how bad it is and how it needs to be addressed, but nothing is going to change unless we amass a movement um, to the scale that we need it to be. Um, but pediatricians and all doctors, I think, um, who have taken the Hippocratic Oath to uphold their patients' interests, um, no matter what. I think that this can also be applied to the, to the climate. Pediatricians, without a doubt, have an obligation to speak up for um, and have the interests in mind that they got into their profession to help children and to serve and provide for children to have the best development and the most healthy development that they possibly can. And in a world that's constantly changing due to the climate and in a future for a whole generation that's almost looking apocalyptic in some sense, um, pediatricians without a doubt in their heart and souls know that something really needs to be done. Um, so I believe that because that was the very oath they took and that's how it is applied directly to 
um, their practice. So I just want to see all doctors out on the streets with us and taking real community grassroots action beyond discussions. Thank you. And Dr. Eric Kloss has asked uh, Dr. Rubin, your slides reference limited green space and de degraded uh, built environments. Do you believe that framing these as community gaps provides a better opportunity for solution development? Oh, you're on mute, Leslie. Well, <laughs> happens too often. Anyway, the better you can understand and characterize adverse environmental uh, effects, the better you can make a difference. And I defer to Perry for her wonderful characterization of the um, adverse urban environments uh, that, that um, poor and minority uh, people are, are uh, in a way compelled to live uh, for a variety of historic reasons. And I think that uh, what we need to do is to continue to discuss this and examine it and see what the solutions are. And I think uh, I take Isabella's charge very seriously. And I, I think her, her, her uh, passion is born out of a real concern and she uses the word apocalyptic. And I think that um, with the wildfires and with the hurricanes and with the droughts and disasters that we're seeing on our planet, I think uh, it is very real. And I think it behooves us all to take whatever action we can, whatever steps we can in each of our lives to make a, a difference because every little difference will count. Thank you so much. Our final question is from uh, Natasha Dejanet, um, thank you so much for the wonderful talks. We're at the intersection of concurrent health challenges. What keeps you all inspired and moving ahead on climate action during a litany of challenging times and crisis uh, moments that we are living in? I'll answer that first. For me, uh, children and youth, they are, um, as I mentioned, their nature is uh, to move, to make change, to see things in a more optimistic way, and they have the energy and the creativity, so um, they keep me motivated, my kids and all kids that I see um, as part of my profession. And seeing uh, you as Isabella uh, presenting this in such a clear and articulated way is really inspiring, so I think we should follow their lead. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump in briefly on that? I'll jump in. I would second that and add to it um, that, it's, that it's, it's the connections with people, uh, ch children for sure, but also our colleagues who I uh, draw support from and love very much. This, this week, our environmental justice, environmental health world uh, lost a, a giant, Cecil Corbin Mark, who worked with WE ACT um, here in New York City. And I think uh, people like Cecil are what keep me going. Um, he fought every day and also sort of building on the question about getting out of our silos. It was people like Cecil who helped me as a physician feel like I can make a change on a bigger than just a patient level because he understood the workings of, of legislation um, and how, where the levers that you had to pull existed within policies, whether or not it's looking at things like non-energy benefits when we're doing energy assessments or something like that. What we need to do, also to some of the questions about to be, to hold the decision makers or the people who have the power more accountable. Um, and so that we can shift um, the, uh, how the assessments are being made in the first place and ultimately do full cost accounting for all of this. So. In, in honor of Cecil, we keep going. Thank you, Perry. I think that's a perfect way to, uh, to wrap us up by lifting up such a wonderful colleague and human being. Um, it, we, we should all be so lucky to uh, continue in his legacy uh, by continuing this fight. Um, we know it's, it's, it's quite a set of challenges we have. Um, and at this point, I just wanna thank all of our panelists. Thank you for your time, your expertise. Thank you for all of our participants and move things back to John. Great. Well, um, I, I don't know how many of you were able to join the National Academy of Medicine annual meeting, but it was kind of like a baseball game. They had canned applause for all the speakers. And if I had canned applause now, it would just be screaming out of your speakers 
for the great job that you have done, NSA as moderator, and, and each of our panelists. I'm so grateful. Um, we've touched a lot of tough topics today. We, the, the, the running theme that I heard so much was, was that of, of trauma to children, and that trauma is deep-rooted, and it's past trauma. And Isabella and, and Gradia made us made it clear this was present trauma, and we know with climate change worsening, we risk future trauma, and we know that from a public health perspective, we just can't continue the status quo in terms of either the way we handle the climate crisis or the way we handle all of the systemic um, uh, institutional disadvantage and, and trauma that is perpetrated on, on members of our society. So thank you to everybody. Isabel re uh, reminded us of, uh, a wonderful aphorism that I quote from my colleague Howard Frumkin, that, that numbers numb and that stories stir us. And um, I think all of our speakers provided stories that stir us, uh, as well as numbers to inform us. I don't think people were numb today. So thank you all. And uh, let me hand it back now, now to Tricia Castrania, who will close us out. Thank you, John. I just wanted to say thank you to all of our speakers. Um, thank you to uh, all of our great um, participants and uh, all of you that have joined with us. I want to thank Nathan, Paris, and Cassandra for their incredible technical help and bringing us all together. Um, we hope to see you guys again um, in January. If you have any feedback, please feel free to reach out to me or to John. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. The, this event has been recorded and will be posted at the link right here on the top right here. So you can um, get that there or you can contact me directly. Otherwise, everyone have a great day and thanks for joining us.